So, welcome to all carbon-based life forms, and our welcome also goes out to any silicon-based life forms, non-corporeal beings, even though they're kind of tough to spot, and also any synthetic life forms that might be in here. Thank you all for joining us to this lecture series in such great numbers and coming from so many different backgrounds. It is my pleasure to open this lecture series on behalf of my friend and co-organizer, uh, Martin Gabriel from the Department of History and our entire team of 15 uh, speakers, many of whom are here today or also just walking down the stair. Uh, who am I and how do, uh, what do I do and how does that fit into the larger scheme of things? My name is Stefan Rabic and I'm uh, right now just an external lecturer in American Studies at the Department of English and American Studies. Uh, basically two main fields of research. I deal a lot with the U.S. American West, but more generally also the 18th and 19th century um, America, basically, and I do science fiction studies across media. Now, our class today presents something that hasn't really been done before in this form here at AAU. Star Trek as a topic brought 15 uh, speakers from all four faculties, representing a total of 11 disciplines, along with a visiting uh, professor from the U.S. together. And together with your help and your participation, we will work on a way, our work, our way towards the 50th anniversary of what has unarguably become um, one of the greatest popular cultural artifacts in this world. In 1966, uh, the first episode of what uh, is now called Star Trek, the original series, known as Raumschiff Enterprise here in the German-speaking world, went on the air. It started a process uh, that would see five spin-off series if you count the short-lived animated uh, uh, series in the 1970s, and 10 motion pictures creating and maintaining a science fictional world that roughly spans three centuries. A little service announcement right at the beginning, I said 10 motion pictures. The recent reboot were uh, a Star Trek of Star Trek that features new actors playing the roles of the original characters will not be included as part of our journey over the course of this semester. Um, but another service announcement right at the beginning, like it says in the course description, you don't need to know anything about science fiction in general, uh, nor the Star Trek continuum in particular in order to take part in our interdisciplinary journey. Um, while we, of course, celebrate the 50th anniversary of the original series, we as a group, as a team, we decided that we'll draw on the entire continuum because the world created by the original Star Trek show continued to resonate with people in one permutation or another for more than 40 years. This makes a synoptic or a broad angle view an interdisciplinary appreciation of this universe necessary. A few organizational items at the beginning before we uh, travel to the fr final frontier together. Uh, this is a lecture type course, uh, which means the standard credits that you'll get for it is three CTS points. However, since this class is also attached to various different programs, we ask you to double check the ECTS credit structure in the course uh, description. For example, if you take this class for the BA or MA program in uh, Applied Cultural Studies, or science, I think it is. Uh, the class is worth e uh, four ECTS points last time I checked. A note on language, uh, as you've already realized, this lecture is gonna be in English. Like it says in the course description, this class, the talks in this class will be both in German and also in English. Uh, should you encounter any difficulties language-wise, we ask you to work together with your peers, help each other, and uh, exchange notes, and so on and so forth. What can you expect to get from us? apart from what will hopefully be 15 engaging and thought-provoking uh, talks. All class material that we use here, the slides, uh, various other additional materials, will be shared with you in digital form on our Moodle platform, which is under the care of our Chief of Operations, uh, also known as our Study Assistant, Thomas Fala, who's in the far back. Um, so he's in charge of that. A note on the exam right at the beginning, uh, since it's a lecture type course, we have three sittings of the exam, one scheduled for February 3rd. Um, we'll, uh, it will be an electronic Moodle-based uh, exam, which will be facilitated by our e-learning department. And we also have our very own e-learning tutor, Mrs. Anna Schlintl, who you can contact via Moodle also if you have any questions about that. In terms of the content for the exam, it's very simple, very straightforward. 
basically everything that we cover in the lectures, um, during the lectures, and we aim for a mix of multiple choice and short answer type of questions at the exam. Since we've got a lot of uh, non-native English and non-native German speakers in here, we'd like to cater to your needs. So we decided that all questions will be made available in both languages, and you can also choose which language you'd like to use uh, to, uh, to write down your answer. <coughs> we also invite you all, of course, to uh, actively contribute to this class. So there will be a, uh, a forum on Moodle where you, if you uh, happen to come across something interesting on the, on, uh, on the internet, for instance, an article, video clip, or even a funny meme, because things are already uh, gearing up towards the 50th anniversary, uh, we ask you to uh, share that uh, with the rest of the class. Just add a brief note as to what you found, where you found it, and also why you think it's relevant. Um, I think that covers more or less the boring, albeit essential, organizational part. Who of you is ready to travel to the final frontier? Good. While prepping for this class, I was wondering how I would invite you all to join us on this journey, opening up something so vast as, as Star Trek. Because if you boil it down to numbers, we're talking about more than 700 hours of uh, television and film, spanning more than 40 years of entertainment history. And as Martin and I were following people signing up on, on Zeus, uh, we were very happy to see that many of you come from so many different backgrounds, uh, many different disciplines, but also different um, nationalities. And it reminded us of the initial phase of uh, what brought us as a group of speakers together. <clears throat> and this actually gives us the three leitmotifs, which together form the overarching theme for this class. Uh, we, first, we have Star Trek's broad reach, its broad resonance globally, and also its broad recognition. And taken together, this speaks to Star Trek's broad, in academic terms, interdisciplinary relevance. In very simple terms, Star Trek means something. Or more precisely, it has multiple meanings. It will be interpreted differently by the same people at different times and by different people at the same time. So I thought I'll opt for an anecdotal entry point to open it up a little bit. I've just come back from the US uh, where I had the good fortune to bump into a real life astronaut. Yes, they actually do walk around on the Earth. They're not just floating up in space. And I met him at the base of Mount Hood in Washington State, and we got a talking. Uh, he's an aeronautics engineer by training, and um, it didn't take too long for him to get to the point where he told me, without me actually asking about it, that watching Star Trek inspired him to become a scientist, to study engineering, to go on to study aeronautical engineering. And he's just one of many examples that speak to the long and reciprocal relationship between real space exploration and Star Trek, which is actually well documented. Earlier this summer, an Italian uh, astronaut, who you can see here up on the, on the slide, made it a point of wearing a Star Trek uniform on the International Space Station and tweeted the picture back to Earth. The first African-American female astronaut um, was very vocal about uh, the one thing that inspired her, and that was Lieutenant Uhura from the original show inspired her to become an astronaut. In turn, uh, Mae Jameson got a guest role on Star Trek The Next Generation. And also, some of you might have heard the story that the prototype of the space shuttle was renamed Enterprise after a fan letter campaign convinced NASA to change its name. And the cast of the original show was present at the christening of, of the uh, space shuttle. I have another anecdotal example. I'm pretty sure that earlier this year, you have noticed the global resonance that was triggered by Leonard Nimoy's death. He played Commander Spock, who undoubtedly is one of the most um, <coughs> readily recognized figures in popular culture. He was a childhood hero for many people across generations. Him being half Vulcan, half human, made him a potent symbol for people from all walks of life who sort of felt in between norms or uh, sort of being oppressed by certain social expectations and so on and so forth. People of mixed ethnic descent, the LGBT community, uh, as well as the kid who was unpopular at school because he actually liked science. All of them and more rallied around this popular culture figure. Even President Obama issued a statement commenting on what Spock meant to him after Leonard Nimoy had passed. So I think as I can speak on behalf of the entire organizing team when I say that our lecture is definitely in part dedicated to Leonard Nimoy's memory. I have yet even more examples that point to the broad nature of Star Trek as a topic, if you will. Not only is there this reciprocal relationship between real space science and Star Trek, but also technological development in Star Trek. 
you know, might have already heard this, Martin Cooper, the inventor of the cell phone, um, stated that his inspiration came from watching Captain Kirk talking to his uh, um, handheld communicator on a weekly basis. And just the other week, I stumbled across an article in which leading developers and engineers of Google and Apple um, talked about how the original show still inspires uh, innovation and drives their, their development. The main focus uh, they have now is, of course, on human-computer interaction. And I'll share the article on Moodle also. Think about that the next time you talk to Siri, if you ever talk to Siri, or Cortana, or, or Google Now, for instance. Uh, but at this point, another important service announcement, science fiction in general is not, and I repeat that, it's not about predicting the future. I'll get to that in a bit. But given the track record of certain science fiction universes, you kind of start wondering, right? So it's a bit of an interrelation there. I have another uh, last example, or two last examples, which are much more local and much more recent. Earlier this May, the Raiffeisen Bank decided that um, they wanted to uh, tap into the broad recognition that Star Trek still has as a, as a brand. In the TV commercial, uh, Star Trek is used to underscore that if you're with this bank, you're with the bank of the future, high-tech future bank. And only last week, uh, our colleague Norbert Wolgemuth from the Macroeconomics Department forwarded this visual parody to us, uh, which was posted in response to the election results in Upper Austria. Uh, Star Trek uh, is one of the most parodied popular culture phenomena. Uh, anyone who's ever watched Big Bang Theory or Futurama or the film Galaxy Quest knows that. But in this case, we have sort of an odd inversion going on. Mr. Spock's face is replaced by that of Mr. Strache. Mr. Spock was the embodiment of logic and reason, which cannot necessarily be said about Mr. Strache. <laughs> uh, so that's political. That's political memes for you. Uh, but that also just shows that Star Trek is, uh, is everywhere, or rather it's still everywhere. So we're pursuing the following question for the remainder of this talk. Why does Star Trek still matter? And we're going to frame this along two lines. Why does Star Trek matter as an artifact of popular culture? And why does it matter, and that what it does, as an artifact of science fiction? So we'll start by looking at how science fiction works in general and learn why science fiction, perhaps more than any other story form, is actually ready-made for interdisciplinary um, research. And I even go so far as to say that science fiction is interdisciplinary practice. Science fiction builds on the basic tenets of the scientific method and what we in the humanities call critical thinking. From there, we we'll move on to look uh, at some of what Star Trek has been doing uh, for the past 50 years, and what you as students coming from many different fields can actually do with Star Trek based on what you find in its stories. And in order to do that, I'll tell you a little bit about Star Trek's origins and its workings. And as a cultural studies person, it'll, uh, I'll keep telling you that historical and cultural contexts are everything, basically. Otherwise, Star Trek is just funny-looking people uh, using a lot of technical blah-blah while gallivanting around the galaxy in the spaceship. Uh, so context matters, uh, no matter what you look at, including the discourse of science. So what is the relevance of popular culture, and what do we stand to learn from it? My introductory lecture um, kind of stands in defense of doing popular culture in general, uh, pop popular culture studies in general, and science fiction studies in particular, in a climate that has increasingly become misshapen by the growing corporatization, financialization, and managerialization of academia. After all, some of what my colleagues and I are doing does not necessarily conform to the contemporary discourse of academic knowledge production. At the moment, more value seems to be placed on the immediate applicability and measurability and quantifiable viability of research. So the production of knowledge and the commodification of students, so people who are sitting right there, um, points to a sort of unsustainable academic practice. But my talk also stands in defiance of the persistent influence of the high culture camp that is still going on in the academia. For example, I usually tell them that uh, to contemporaries of Shakespeare, his plays were very much part of Elizabethan popular culture. They were made for the masses. Uh, so much for a little criticism of the establishment. Uh, there is a need to, uh, to engage with popular culture artifacts quite simply because they matter. And the key word here is popular. They resonate with large, uh, groups of, uh, large cultural groups, large cult uh, cultural bodies. They contain meanings that reflect social values, norms, traditions, hopes and fears, and much more. Uh, of those cultures where they're created. So they're prime access points 
for understanding not only what one or more cultural groups are concerned with at the moment, but also where these concerns come from. And these artifacts are also a great means um, to see who gets and who doesn't get a voice. So we're talking about um, dominant as well as marginalized discourses. But the same reasoning, science fiction matters because it's not mere escapist fantasy or make-believe. We find a democratizing spirit at the heart of science fiction's wide range of allegorical storytelling. Another way of looking at science fiction is like thought-provoking, as thought-provoking morality plays or parables even. So it's a genre that is informed by the semblance, and that's important, which I'll get into in a minute, the semblance of the scientific method. Science fiction stories are infused with this moral imperative to question the very world we live in over and over and over again. So science fiction, speculative nature invites a speculative response. It demands engagement with thought experiments that confront and often overturn our passive acceptance of everyday status quo kind of situations. So, okay. Science fiction, popular culture, critical thinking, the scientific method, interdisciplinary practice, sounds great. How can we all connect that? I'll start with a question. Um, or rather, we need to understand the basic workings of science fiction. What makes science fiction science fiction? Uh, when you think about science fiction stories, what comes to mind? I'll take pretty much anything. What, comes, what was that? Bu Buzz Lightyear. Uh, that's good. Buzz Lightyear. What else? Advanced technology. Advanced technology. What else? Aliens. Aliens. Good. That's true. So robots, spaceships, space battles, you name it. All true and then not quite. Uh, science fiction, uh, usually the good stuff also, is basically all about asking one simply a thought-provoking provo uh, question. That is, what if? What if aliens touch down in front of university right now? That'd be kind of cool and very appropriate at the same time. What if all electronics cease to function from one day to the next? Um, what if a man from the Upper Paleolithic, so basically a Stone Age man, was still alive today, having witnessed entire history unfold, which is appointed to this film on, on, on the left, which is one of the best uh, examples I know of to explain the workings of science fiction? Or what if we finally got going to Mars, but something terrible happens along the way? Which sounds, of kind of, sounds kind of familiar because it's happening in the movies right now. Um, so science fiction is a means to extend our limited reach of human agency in what we call the primary reality. And science fiction does that by way of a plausible, science-based, not scientific, imagination. Science fiction allows us to think in alternatives or imagine alternatives by way of a sort of a, a estranging distance. So there's this weird stuff going on, which goes far beyond our everyday reality. And this is what provokes an intellectual response. What we often find is that various issues such as racial um, discrimination or gender discrimination, questions of sustainability or ethics, um, especially human hubris, so the, um, the issue of overreaching, are then projected onto others in the, uh, in the science fiction universes. So uh, uh, alien, uh, we're, we're being invaded now, we're being invaded, I can see that, so it's a sort of like alien invasion. Another interesting sci-fi scenario, what if a photographer shows up in the middle of the lecture? So we can go, we can ex explore that uh, at, at another point. So science fiction basically gives us uh, a model for constructing imaginative worlds uh, that where we ourselves and uh, uh, various issues that we deal with can be uh, explored from an estranged and thus intellectually stimulating point of view. And science fiction st or stories do that by introducing that which is weird, that which is kind of strange, what we as sci-fi scholars call the novum, so like aliens, for instance. Uh, and science fiction stories, which sort of sets off a process, and science fiction stories follow that process by extrapolating or speculating about how we as human beings would react to such events, how our behaviors would change or not change for that matter. And science fiction has borrowed many terms and techniques from real science, like for instance the term extrapolation, which is actually a mathematical term, or Ernst Mach's concept of the Gedanken experiment, which is basically a thought experiment, uh, but expanded on them in terms of plausibility. So of course science fiction does not speculate or extrapolate seriously. Like I said earlier, science fiction is not about predicting the future. Plausibility outranks possibility. Um, what's the difference and why is it important? Look up in any dictionary, the definition for plausible, and you get something along the lines, quote, superficially pleasing, persuasive, but also reasonable. Um, 
So that's how sci-fi stories achieve the effect that we suspend our disbelief. Plausibility creates a sufficient degree of realism. Uh, there are many elements in science fiction that do not fit into our primary reality, like we said, aliens, spaceships, you name it. But they, in the sci-fi stories, they are, and this is uh, essential, explored and asserted as facts. And in other words, science fiction, unlike other fantastic genre, uh, genres, has to explain and legitimize their own sense of wonder. So just by comparison, magic works precisely because it's not explained nor explainable. All you do is just cast a spell, basically, and something happens. In science fiction, it has to go along with an explanation, which of course is also just made up, but it makes it sound more plausible. So sci-fi basically imitates, if you will, uh, the scientific method, but it does not practice it. Um, so in short, science fiction is an intellectually stimulating sandbox. It, has also, it also has the capacity to provide us with educative spaces uh, for reflecting on a broad range of issues, some of which we'll see uh, in a little bit. Um, in many ways, it acts as interdisciplinary practice also because it expands and connects rather than separates different discourses, um, cultural, ecological, economic, scientific, and also technological, of course. And with these tools in hand, I think we're about ready to, to travel to the final frontier. No matter how you approach the Star Trek universe, you cannot uh, forego introducing and acknowledging its principal creator, the man on the slide on the uh, top left, Eugene Wesley Roddenberry, and his vision uh, of and intentions for uh, this fictional future set in outer space which marks the genesis of what be become Star Trek. So who was Ron Berry? What's his story? He was born in a con uh, into a conservative uh, family in El Paso, Texas in 1921. His father was a policeman, soon moved out to uh, LA with his family where Ron Berry grew up. As a child, he was fairly, often fairly sick, so he became a voracious reader and he discovered the power of science fiction. And then he enrolled in engineering, uh, he did the program in engineering and he also enrolled in a, a, a police school prep program and he expanded on his studies in engineering, became an aeronautical engineer, and then he also earned his pilot's license just in time so that he could serve in the Army Air Corps after the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor in 1941. Uh, he served as a bomber pilot in uh, World War II, and upon a return, he continued his piloting career in the, uh, civilian uh, aviation. But soon after a plane crash, he changed jobs, moved back to LA, uh, became a police officer, uh, for the LAPD, and in the 50s, the LAPD had strong connections with the movie industry and the television industry, consulting crime, store, uh, crime films, crime procedurals, uh, and that's how Ron Berry basically entered the world of television. Uh, he also taught himself how to write scripts, uh, and he first consulted on police shows, and soon he sold his very first script to police shows such as Highway Patrol, and he, then he became a prolific contributor to the CBS Western Have Gun uh, uh, Will Travel, which helped to establish his credits. Um, so that's how he sharpened his teeth in television. But he was also looking for new opportunities. He probed niches of the market like science fiction storytelling for television. And back in those days, so we're talking mid-50s, late-50s, sci-fi on TV was uh, only on the cusp of uh, gaining its maturity. Most TV executives and studios thought that this is the stuff that children or teenagers like. And serious science fiction television wouldn't work anyway because it's too expensive uh, to produce. This is when he formulated his uh, first idea for Star Trek or what would become Star Trek in a document simply titled Star Trek Is, dated March 11, 1964. And this is what he used to shop his idea, to pitch his idea to various studios around Hollywood. Um, his idea and his vision was very much shaped by him being a self-proclaimed humanist. He believed in this very basic fundamental sense of humanism uh, and fused that with a positive, albeit somewhat naive, uh, belief in technological progress. Technological progress that would automatically lead to uh, social progress also. Uh, so he had this idealistic belief in humanity's potential, you know, that we are capable of outgrowing our infancy, our petty, corrupted, and also potentially self-destructive inf infancy. Um, another important service announcement at this point, Ron Bear is often given the um, status of the sole creator, like an auteur almost. Indeed, it was his vision and his idea, uh, but one thing that I also want you to remember about television in particular, or also, also goes for films or video games, those are multi 
author media. So it takes uh, the contributions of many different people uh, for something like Star Trek to be created and then also to be maintained for more than 40 years. Um, so a number of producers and script writers are at least as important perhaps as Ron Berry, particularly after Ron Berry had passed away in 1991. Um, so Ron Berry definitely had a lot of author uh, authorial and also, uh, also authoritative control early on and also during Star Trek's most trying times. But after his death, producers and writers like Rick Berman or Michael Piller uh, did their best to keep the universe uh, alive. And most of Star Trek, in just uh, boiling it down to mere numbers, was actually produced after Ron Berry had died. Um, so let's quickly look at this fictional world that he uh, created and thought of before talking a little bit more about the essential context that led to the creation of Star Trek so that we can unlock the key to why Star Trek is, uh, re resonates still so broadly today. So, Star Trek's utopian future in under five minutes. I'll try to keep it under five minutes. Uh, it's probably best described or most concisely described by Captain Jean-Luc Picard played by Patrick Stewart in the eighth Star Trek film, uh, Star Trek First Contact. He says that in the 23rd and 24th century, quote, the acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity, unquote. Now there's a lot of stuff in that that needs a little bit of unpacking. The realization uh, that we as human beings are not alone in the universe supposedly leads to a radical shift in human self-perception and this new sense of purpose for all of humanity. Uh, by way of technological advancement, which no longer benefits just the wealthy, uh, few, but rather everyone, we supposedly managed to wipe out hunger, disease, and war in a little over two generations. By that time, humanity will also be united, leaving its national and its corporate uh, existence behind. So it's a little bit like an inversion of what, today, what we today label the other 99%. After having made first contact with extraterrestrial life, humanity uh, is soon on its way to, into outer space to learn from it, uh, to meet new life out there, and so on and so forth. Before long, humanity takes its place in the um, interstellar community, becoming instrumental in forming a large coalition, the so-called United Federation of Planets, of more than, this is a coalition of more than 150 species, who join in the spirit of mutual cooperation, exploration, and peace. The Federation is represented by an organization called Starfleet, which is a semi-military, semi-scientific, semi-exploratory organization that is both peacekeeper and explorer at the same time. Just as a footnote here, because it's central to my own dissertation, uh, the world this is envisioned there, um, uh, that Star Trek envisions, is entirely modeled on what we here back on Earth call the Age of Sail. So we're talking the late 18th century, early 19th century, and the Royal Navies role during that time. Back in those days, the Royal Navy uh, was an agent of exploration, discovery, diplomacy, but also colonization and conflict. But Martin Gabriel, my colleague, will pick that apart a little bit more in his talk. Um, and with this analogy, Star Trek's world gives us uh, a neo-enlightenment in this future. In this future, <coughs> there prevails a broad belief in the good of knowledge, the good of science, and also the good of technology. And there's this resurgence of the centrifugal, this outward looking mindset that takes us out there again, that uh, speaks to our wanderer spirit, if you will. One important note, Star Trek presents a positive uh, and hopeful outlook of humanity's future in outer space. And it's, as such, it's also a great example for a utopia. And there is the one thing that you need to know about a utopia. They work in our imagination because key details are left kind of vague. Most importantly, these details uh, pertain to the processes that it took to achieve this utopian future. In Star Trek's future, we basically have access to almost unlimited resources, which is coupled to forms of almost unlimited energy, which is also supposedly sustainable. So uh, that opens many, many critical, uh, or opens a room for many critical questions, uh, which will be explored in greater detail by some of our speakers like Verena Vinivata, Norbert Wolgemuth also, and Wilfred Emmenreich, who will pursue that in their talks. So much for the world of Star Trek in under five minutes. Um, before we look at a few examples, we'll need to look a little bit more about cultural and historical context of its origins so that we know why Star Trek does what it does. Um, the conception of Star Trek was greatly influenced by the American zeitgeist and American self-perception 
uh, on both the domestic as well as the international uh, stage in the immediate aftermath of World War II, leading up to various events in the 1960s. Uh, and please note that I'll be painting in very broad strokes here because this is, after all, not a history lesson, but we need some of that. So even before the U.S. contributed to the uh, Allied victory in World War II, the 20th century was already hailed as the all-American century, basically. And victory in the war seemed to confirm this. And U.S. Americans were on the road uh, to become the self-declared leaders and defenders and champions of the Western world, a world that soon became very polarized. There are two ways of looking at this narrative of the American century and the subsequent optimism and self-confidence that Americans are so very fond of exporting to the rest of the world. On the one hand, of course, it's a success story. Uh, it's a story of growing uh, prosperity at home, first just for some and then for a few more uh, members of society. And it also um, uh, gives us a steadily growing, uh, the ste steadily growth of American power, reach and influence abroad. Subjectively, it's also a story of constant internal disagreement of the role of government in American society. And it's a story, especially a story of uh, struggle for equal rights between individuals, ethnicities, classes, genders, uh, and so on and so forth. The le years leading up to Star Trek's conception were thus shaped by a booming economy at home and a general optimism, uh, particularly uh, domestically. So it sure was good to be American in the 1950s in particular, especially a white working class or a middle class heterosexual Protestant male American. Okay? So this already points uh, to the growing struggle for equality, especially racial equality, but also uh, gender equality and economic equality uh, uh, for all those who did not belong to this uh, dominant privileged group. Internationally, uh, the time, uh, that time saw the Cold War heating up a little bit, if you will. I'm just going to throw in one example, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. It also saw America enter the Vietnam War, which of course was only a part of the larger Cold War conflict. Um, but there was also an upside for Americans, and that's the Americanization of basically the Western world. Starting in the mid to late 1950s, we can really see uh, America's cultural imperialism taking hold in terms of economic and um, entertainment products that were exported to the rest of the world. And along with those products, of course, American values and American uh, worldview, if you will. Uh, again, generally speaking, a lot of energy, a lot of optimism permeated the American zeitgeist. But underneath all of this, there were rumbles. It was rumbling. Fear actually reigned supreme. There were many different fears. Americans were afraid of being infiltrated and subverted by uh, the Soviets. Um, they were also afraid of people speaking out against the establishment, um, people who thought for themselves. Um, there were growing fears about a nuclear attack, of course, uh, fears of a race war, fears of juvenile delinquency, and so on and so forth. Um, and all of this led to the gradual, actually, gradual fraction, uh, fraction of this culture of optimism, and it erupted in the 1960s, where we see, for instance, the civil rights movement succeeding in ending segregation, uh, achieving equal rights for African Americans and other ethnicities. There's also a great time, a sexual revolution going on, uh, massive protests in reaction to the Vietnam War. Uh, and all of that was, was also accompanied with people getting more and more critical of the government and also this growing distrust of the American government. Uh, so that was roughly what was going on in the States while Star Trek was uh, developed and then aired in 1966. And to perhaps confuse you just a little bit more, uh, let me throw in three more elements. President Kennedy, the space race, and Westerns. As some of you might know, Kennedy is often equated or uh, viewed vis-a-vis -vis the American space race. In the beginning of, the, of his presidency, he committed, uh, or he vowed that the nation would commit itself to landing on the moon and also bring it back uh, by the end of the decade. Um, and this, uh, this race for the moon galvanized the public's imagination. There's a big space craze going on. People are interested in science, the moon, outer space, exploration, and so on and so forth. But the space race, of course, was also just part of the Cold War paradigm. Uh, of course, it was, um, the goal was to beat the Soviets to the moon. In another way, it was just an ideological prestige project. Uh, what the Kennedy administration also did, it gave us the language uh, of how people began to see and understand outer space exploration. And not only that, also the language, how they dealt with uh, and tackled the challenges of the 1960s. Uh, 
And he did that uh, by tapping into a narrative or a mythos that is central to uh, the American national psyche, and that is the narrative of westward expansion, so the conquest of the American West, Wild West and all that. Um, and the key word here is the frontier, because that's what he used to uh, define the opportunities and challenges of this decade of the 1960s. He called them the, uh, the new frontier. The frontier is this quintessential space in, American, uh, in the American imagination. Back in the day, in the 19th century, this was the place where Americans would go to out west to uh, reinvent themselves, start with a clean slate, start over. Uh, it was also the place where you know, American civilization would be realized. They carried their civilization westward and brought it to the savage world, the wilderness, as it were. Um, so part of the American dream, if you will. Or at least that's the romanticized mythos of the American West. And that became a central part of American identity and self-perception. Um, and Kennedy uh, was very much attuned to what was going on underneath the surface of optimism. So he used the images uh, associated with the American West, metaphors, illusions, I, uh, certain terms like the frontier, um, to, to address them, uh, to give them a, a positive uh, meaning. Uh, and Amer the American mainstream had already been, or was already familiar with all of that uh, at that time. So we're talking end of the 50s, early 60s. Why? Westerns. That's why. Roughly speaking, between the 1940s and 60s, Westerns reigned supreme on the American media landscape. There was no other genre that was as prolific as the Western. And approximately two generations of Americans um, grew up with uh, Westerns being the most popular of popular culture artifacts. And Westerns were also a major component in America's cultural imperialism. So they exported Westerns throughout the world, which of course made America seem, well, become this country of uh, cowboys and Indians, a world of black and white where the good guys, as in like Americans, would always win in the, rest of the, uh, in the eyes of the rest of the world. But I like, uh, I told you at the beginning, popular cultural artifacts also produce reflections of uh, the cultures uh, that bring them forth. So starting roughly in the mid-1950s, uh, Westerns also began to do more than just celebrate this glorious conquest of the American West. And films such as Broken Arrow or High Noon, up here on the slide, commented on the growing racial conflicts in America. Civic complacency was also a topic and this consensus culture. And there were very popular Western TV shows, such as the TV show Wagon Train, which ran for eight seasons between 1957 and 65. Each week, the audience would see a new story following a passenger on a wagon train making uh, his or her way out west to start a new life. And in this format, uh, the show commented on a number of different issues, such as racial conflicts, the changing roles of women in society, the communist threat, and so on and so forth. So in short, what these Westerns did through metaphors, illusions, analogy, uh, analogies, they began to include some social commentary and social critique. And like I told you earlier, when Ron Berry uh, went around Hollywood trying to sell his idea for Star Trek, TV studios and the executives thought that a serious science fiction was not necessarily worth it. Um, it was too expensive to produce. But they also knew how to make westerns, and they also knew how uh, that westerns worked pretty well. So Ron Berry basically used a cheap trick, perhaps. Uh, he pitched and sold his idea as being little more than a space western, a wagon train to the stars. Instead of horses, they would have spaceships, and instead of uh, six shooters, they would have ray guns. But of course, Ron Berry did not deliver a wagon train to the stars. Star Trek is anything but a space western. So what's at the heart of Star Trek? Um, one of the chief reasons it still has this broad relevance today is probably best summed up by someone who actually starred in Star Trek. And I'd like to share with you a very short clip from a documentary titled Beyond the Final Frontier. You'll see actress Nichelle Nichols share um, a personal anecdote um, about her time on the original show. So we'll screen the clip first. So, now we just got the key to unlock a key part uh, Star Trek storytelling, uh, Roddenberry used science fiction stories and their techniques of estrangement that I just introduced you earlier ever so briefly, you know, making things weird, appear otherworldly, seemingly make-believe. He used all of that to sneak what would then considered controversial topics or issues or ideas past the television censors. Censors strictly regulated what could and could not be said or shown on television uh, back in those days. 
and our distinguished visiting uh, Fulbright specialist uh, will actually talk a lot more about that uh, in his talk. So Star Trek comments on and deals with big universal ideas, uh, but also the concerns and issues and topics of the day, if you will, in allegorical and science fictional form, from racial to gender issues to religion, politics, ethics, the use and misuse of science and technology, genetic manipula manipulation, labor exploitation, destruction of the environment, uh, and seemingly more mundane uh, issues, if you will, such as ageism, challenges faced by uh, young people, and much more. Uh, I just had, a, I had to limit my, my list at one point. Uh, so this uh, is basically the formula that we're looking at. Uh, with this formula and these allegorical intentions at the heart of Star Trek's world, uh, the spin-off series adapted to the cha uh, cha uh, changing historical and cultural contexts. And that's why a show like The Next Generation is very much a product of the late 1980s and early 1990s, uh, as opposed to the last spin-off series, Star Trek Enterprise, which is very much a product of the early 2000s. And now I'd like to show you a few short uh, examples of what you can find and what you can subsequently do with Star Trek from an interdisciplinary point of view. And of course, there's way too many examples I could have uh, gone for, uh, but this is also why we have another 14 speakers lined up for you. Um, at the same time, I would also then like to conclude with another, uh, with a fourth example, showing the limits, or rather the limitations, of Star Trek storytelling. Um, and I'd like you all to help me out a little bit as we uh, read and watch uh, the, these excerpts together. Uh, since we're celebrating the 50th anniversary, I would like to begin with uh, an example from the original series, and the following two short clips are taken from the first season episode, A Taste of Armageddon. Um, sense of foreboding. Uh, once again, uh, the immediate context of the Cold War is essential for, for this episode. Uh, just a brief synopsis, the Enterprise is sent on a diplomatic mission to establish contact and trade relations with the people of Emenior 7. Upon getting closer to the solar system, they're actually warned not to approach, uh, but they ignore that um, because the diplomatic envoy on, on board actually insists they do it anyway. So when Kirk and his landing party beam down to the uh, planet's surface, they learn that Emenia 7 uh, has been at war with its neighbor, Vendikar, for more than 500 years. Without their knowing, the Enterprise and the entire crew become legitimate targets in this conflict. And they also learned that the war they engaged in uh, is somewhat unusual. And I have two short excerpts, which I'm going to show back to back now, and then we'll talk a little bit more about them. So, now we'll try to figure out what was uh, going on, what the uh, episode actually aimed at. Uh, what, sort of, what sort of the resonance uh, or relevance of this episode? Any, any thoughts, any ideas? I dropped a big hint at the beginning. Again, there's hardly any wrong answers. That's the me shutting up part, you talk part. Volunteers? I said Cold War early on. This episode was released at the height of the Cold War. And the episode basically, it's even explained here in the first clip in particular, gives us like this what if scenario, what if scenario of a perpetual hot Cold War. In the second scene, you saw the young woman articulate uh, and basically comment on the so-called MAD doctrine, M-A-D, uh, which supposedly kept the balance of power between the US and the Soviet Union. MAD stands for Mutually Assured Destruction. That meant if one of the two superpowers launched a nuclear attack, the other one would retaliate. And the fear of that happening uh, kept this precarious balance. It also kept the rest of the world in a perpetual state of fear. And Kirk's impulsive uh, reaction on the one hand and Mr. Spock's biting remark points to the fact that the Armenians' rationale for their war is indeed a mad one. The episode ends with Kirk destroying their computers, uh, quote, giving them back the horrors of real war, uh, which forces the two opponents to the negotiating table. So Kirk also does that which Americans uh, think they do best. They interfere for the greater good. So the episode, on the one hand, validates uh, Americans uh, or America's interference politics, while at the same time critiquing um, 
America maintaining this Cold War madness. And I'm just saying this to foreshadow the certain limitations of Star Trek storytelling at the end. Uh, in more general terms, perhaps, this episode is also a critique of the sanitation of war. Uh, we began to thematize this only sort of at the beginning of the, um, of the 1990s uh, with the gold, uh, Gulf War. Um, and unfortunately, we've become very much used to that. Um, you know, destruction and death being delivered by way of a remote control. And we as uh, the spectators also see that uh, what we get served up by the end, uh, at the end of our, uh, the remote control that we hold in our hands on television screens. So mass destruction served up by mass media, uh, which makes it look more like a, a firework than actual combat, something that media uh, uh, scholars uh, have defined as the CNN effect. But that's something that didn't just pertain uh, Vietnam War, Cold War, Gulf War, the war in the Balkans. The topic is sort of still resonates today. Just think of the use of a rather controversial military capability that is being deployed almost on a daily basis in the Middle East. Any thoughts what I could refer to? Something that still goes on today. It's very, makes war very clean, supposedly clean. Drone attacks, exactly, the use of unmanned drones, drone warfare. Just put that vis-a-vis -vis the line, they materialized fusion bombs just over the surface, so they just popped out, out of nowhere. So we live in a world where somewhere in a container on a military installation in the state of Nevada, someone is operating a drone by a remote control half a world away, uh, proceeding on to neutralize targets. Uh, so once again, uh, this points to the continued relevance of an artifact such as uh, Star Trek because many science fiction stories also, um, uh, you can also use them to actually transcend the original context of production and reception. So this episode would make for a great entry point or useful intellectually stimulating entry point uh, about, uh, for a critical discussion about a questionable practice today. Now today is also a good keyword that I want to use as a segue to my next example. I chose the next example on purpose because of its topicality. It should resonate quite well given the fact, given what's been going on this past few weeks here in Europe uh, with the ongoing refugee crisis. The next excerpts come uh, from a second season episode of the spin-off series Deep Space Nine, an episode titled Sanctuary. Uh, now here's what you need to know about Deep Space Nine. It's quite different. Uh, than other uh, uh, Star Trek shows. For one, because it's not set on the starship um, that travels from one location to another. It's actually set on the space station, or mostly set on the space station. The station is located at an interstellar crossroads, a, a wormhole, which is a shortcut to far reaches of the galaxy. And the station is also located close to the planet Bajor. Bajor had just been liberated from a brutal occupation. They'd been occupied by someone called the Cardassians. I'm just filling you in here because they, all these names will actually be dropped in the, in the two excerpts. Uh, a number of historical wars actually served as potent analogies uh, for this uh, bajoran cardassian conflict and occupation, most importantly, World War II and the Holocaust, but also the Balkan Wars, which were actually going on as the uh, show came out. After the occupation, Starfleet was actually called in to help with relief efforts and start rebuild Bajor and prepare them uh, for joining the Federation. Now in this episode, in Sanctuary, a large number of refugees, alien refugees, the Screans, travel through the wormhole and show up at the station's doorstep. They seek to immigrate to Bajor, uh, which of course creates ex um, sort of uh, predictable tensions. The Screans were displaced uh, because of a war that ravaged their home planet. And once again, I have two short clips, which I'll show back to back. Uh, and you'll see the Bajorans give the Screens their decision uh, about immigration, uh, whether they allow them to immigrate or not, and the thought-provoking final scene of that episode. So by the end of the episode, as you can see, the refugees have been convinced that uh, they should relocate to some other planet. Remember, science fiction often asks us to think along. It often uh, raises questions that we as the audience have to come to terms with on our own. So the proverbial food for thought. Uh, this episode produces a strong comment on how we in the Western world deal with the displaced other. Uh, whether it's so-called boat people, asylum seekers, refugees, you name it. 
the episode directs a moralizing and open-ended question at us at, at the end. And I think the uh, episode also aims, among other things, uh, at how the discussion that we still have uh, about immigration and asylum, uh, all these discussions are permeated uh, by the discourse of integration, when instead we should be talking about inclusion. The problem with the discourse of integration is uh, that it serves to maintain this paradigm of us, the dominant cultural group, the norm, versus the many others, the marginalized groups, whoever they might be. Inclusion, on the other hand, aims to counteract that, counteract that any differences are used to stratify people into hierarchies. And the episode leaves us with a sense of disappointment and failure, uh, even if it's only temporary. Uh, and ideally, uh, if that's what we'd like to take away from the episode, it asks the audience to do better. And I think the, uh, the episode actually basically, or the few examples I showed you speaks, speak for themselves and resonate quite strongly with what's going on at the moment. Now I have uh, one more example uh, showcasing the breadth of Star Trek storytelling before we wrap things up by way of another example that actually points to the limits of Star Trek storytelling. Uh, because we should not forget to also be critical of the mythos and values that Star Trek is invested in. I brought ex um, an example for what you'll often find throughout the Star Trek continuum. That is stories, or in this case it's one story, uh, that deals with ethical, uh, an ethical question. And you, you get that a lot, so ethical questions uh, throughout the entire Star Trek continuum. And they usually arise whenever it comes to the use and or misuse of technology, uh, knowledge, also medical issues. And we all got it sort of wrapped up into a neat bundle in this one episode. Uh, so stories that really open big epistemological questions. What is knowledge? How is knowledge gained? And also to what end do we use our knowledge? Now the following clip is taken from a fifth season episode of Star Trek Voyager titled Nothing Human. Uh, once again a brief synopsis, uh, Voyager reacts to a distress call and saves an injured, non-humanoid, insect-like being. So this might look like a, a super huge bug, but it's actually a sentient life form. And in this rescue process, uh, the life form attaches itself to Voyager's chief engineer, Belana Torres, and uses her as a lifeboat, which actually threatens her life. Unfortunately, Voyager's doctor, who you're actually going to see, lacks the sufficient uh, expertise in exobiology. So they come up with a uh, wonderful plan to uh, give him access to an expert in exobiology, a consultant, um, a holographic consultant. And with the help of uh, this consultant, um, they could actually help to save Belana's life. But then a debate ensues as to where uh, and how this expert op has obtained uh, his expertise and his knowledge. So you will see a conversation between this consultant, a Cardassian named Krell Moset, uh, and Voyager's doctor. And remember, the Cardassians were uh, the ones who occupied Bajor. So just, just a big hint there again. So once again, perhaps there is someone in the room uh, who can tell me what, and more specifically perhaps who, are the obvious historical analogies in this, uh, this, this short excerpt points to. So any guesses to whom Krell Moset might have been modeled on? Yes, uh, correct answer, Nazi doctor Josef Mengele, who performed barbaric experiments on people in Auschwitz. Uh, and I think their conversation is fairly self-explanatory. It raises the following question, by what means do we gain knowledge and to what uh, ends do we make use of it? And the episode also takes a nice jab at knowledge gained by way of experimentation on lower life forms, like experiments on animals. And Krell uh, raises a valid point uh, that it's very convenient, of course, to distinguish between higher and lower animals, uh, something that we call speciesism. Uh, and this is just one more example that shows the broad range of uh, Star Trek and also the educational potential of science fiction in general. So whenever uh, uh, stories like technology, interaction with people and technology, use of knowledge come up, we see uh, Star Trek shine fairly well, and it's also something that uh, our colleague Joachim Algaia will probably touch on next, next week. So all of the stuff that we've seen now looks like great stuff, basically, very thought-provoking, and there's hundreds more examples that I could, show, uh, could have shown. Uh, but we still need to question the very vision of the future that Star Trek presents. 
Remember what I said uh, about popular culture artifacts uh, in the beginning. There are reflections and refractions of cultural communities uh, in which they are conceived. Uh, so by way of concluding, we need to add a little disclaimer that serves to criticize both Star Trek's allegorical story format and the underlying values of its utopian uh, world in which those stories take place. And we uh, can do this uh, by asking a very simple question. Whose story is it? I told you that uh, television is a multi-author medium. Uh, Roddenberry uh, might have been the one who came up with the idea, expanded on it, and others contributed to it. But that's not what I'm getting at. Uh, we need to think about this uh, form from a cultural, mythological, um, historical point of view, if you will. Whose story uh, is it uh, that is tied to what kind of veldbuilt worldview that Star Trek propagates above all else, and despite the good stuff, the great thought-provoking stuff that we get? And I'd like to do that by way of a final example. It's a short clip from an episode of uh, uh, The Next Generation, which already used in various introductory lectures, highlighting the basic tenets of cultural and critical thinking. Once again, it shows that science fiction comes with critical thinking already built in. So that's why science fiction, I would argue, makes for a great teaching tool. The episode in question is called Who Watches the Watchers? Uh, and in it, Captain Picard and his crew are mistakenly exposed to an alien uh, culture that basically lives at the Bronze, uh, Bronze Age level. Uh, they mistake Picard as some sort of god, and they start worshipping him. In the clip, uh, the captain tries to convince uh, their leader, um, a woman called Nuria, that he's of course not a god, and he uses critical thinking to do that. And he does that in a beautiful uh, uh, um, uh, argumentation, it's beautiful rhetoric also, very simple and straightforward. And, but this is also a great entry point to start talking about the uh, power of cultural myths. So there's actually two dimensions to this clip. So we'll watch that first and then dive right into it. So. In this case, the critical thinking part was fairly obvious. How does the captain uh, employ critical thinking? By way of analogy, uh, analogy, of course. In best Star Trek tradition, epitomizing humanist thought, he uses the story of progress to discredit superstition. And he convinces Nuria uh, that his people are simply further along on this, thing call, uh, on this ladder called civilization. Uh, like science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke argued, any technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. Now what is even more interesting and challenging perhaps, uh, at least at first, is whose story of progress is this? Whose version of history is it? Picard's, of course, is the human story, or more specifically, the mythos of Western civilization presented through a lens of Anglo-American exceptionalism. Uh, so there is this belief of linear uh, progress that is one of the core beliefs in uh, the Western Judeo-Christian tradition. And in short, there is this belief that uh, we always progress from a, a lower stage to a higher stage of development. And this progress is always linear because it always goes up. I'm not saying that I subscribe to this paradigm. In this belt build, progress is measured by, uh, by various means. What kind of technological progress have we achieved or reached? Do we still live in caves? Do we live in huts? Or do we uh, build brick buildings? Or do we keep written records uh, of our history? Or are we an oral uh, culture? Or do we have certain political institutions, et cetera, et cetera? Now, it's pretty clear that this narrative creates a hierarchy uh, between those who are higher up on, uh, and those who are lower on the lower rungs of this ladder of civilization. Um, and this is why I'd like uh, to urge you always to ask who sets the standards for these measurements, which always raises issues of power. Again, whose story is this? We can track this mythos of Western civilization uh, from ancient, uh, basically from ancient Greece, uh, ba Babylon and Greece, through, uh, through the o Roman Empire, all the way to post-World uh, War II American century. And I hope my historian friends will forgive me for this most condensed uh, and a very selective version of Western civilization. Uh, but it's also just one version of history, spelled with a capital H. It leaves out many others, other cultures, other peoples, other parts of the world that were not ranked among those who represent the epitome of Western civilization at one point or another. So as you can see, Star Trek is both a product of that mythos, yet at the same time it can be used to criticize uh, uh, that mythos at the same time. 
so by way of this final um, um, uh, excerpt, I'd like to wrap things up a little bit and produce a little bit of an outlook or some more food for thought. I think I've already given you a lot of food for thought, but there's a little bit more. Um, so what does this leave us uh, with for the next 13 weeks? Star Trek Res has received uh, quite a lot of scrutiny and criticism from scholars and scientists uh, from many different fields, uh, and our class will continue in the, sa uh, in the same vein. Uh, if I were to summarize the overall criticism or charge uh, that is usually brought against Star Trek, uh, then it is that Star Trek holds great potential, a great promise, but it doesn't do enough to follow through. Uh, for example, there is much one could say about uh, the images of gender norms in Star Trek. Uh, but as an afterthought, it also serves to acknowledge that Star Trek tried to, at least pretended to try, to do more than many other science fiction television shows and movies. It's definitely one of the few uh, that presents a hopeful outlook of the future. And let's not forget the overall value of a centrifugal, so that is an outward-looking mindset, an intellectual curiosity in general, that is at the heart of Star Trek. So projects that are future-bound, future-oriented, whether we're talking about real space science or imaginary space exploration, uh, which, despite their you know, political difficulties, can only be completed in some distant decade or century, if at all, uh, all of the, uh, these projects or imaginings point to the fact that there will be a future, a potent reminder that there will actually be a future. So despite its ethnocentrism, some normativity, the scientific eschatology, and despite the continuation of this neo-colonialism in outer space, Star Trek's hopeful and optimistic outlook for the future in outer space is genuine. And I would argue that we're in the need of a centrifugal belt build or worldview standing at the middle of the second decade of the 21st century, a time where anti-intellectualism is on the rise again. So is the corporatization of education. And ahistorical thinking uh, is spreading. Cultural and historical contexts seem to matter less and less. So does being literate in historical knowledge and also some basic scientific knowledge. So this points to a potentially centripetal, as in like inward looking mindset, which runs the danger of promoting ignorance, suspicion, and fear of the unknown. And that just gives us a wonderful, an additional and very good reason to take a wide angle view and an interdisciplinary look at what Star Trek has to offer. I'd like to uh, end this on what might be considered a polemic note by quoting uh, Philip J. Fry from Futurama, who said, quote, the world needs Star Trek to give people hope for the future. And since we're still doing good for time, I'm more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Questions? Stuff that you always wanted to know about Star Trek or science fiction or anything else. I'll, I'll try to come up with a meaningful answer. Yes, all the way in the back. Yeah, I like to know why you didn't include the reboot into the whole thing. Oh, right. I didn't expect it as the first question, but uh, I came prepared. I came prepared. As a matter of fact, at least, but that's more personal opinion even though I did write papers on it and gave a few papers on it. I would argue, and I think some of my colleagues would agree, uh, uh, that the, the reboot markedly moved away from uh, the original vision, if you will, uh, particularly from this, uh, this allegorical, educational um, substance that is at the heart of Star Trek. The way I understand, uh, both as a fan and as a scholar, and that's where I come back to a paper that I just uh, recently gave, the way I, uh, the only meaningful way I can approach the reboot is to view it as a parody. So for me, the reboot is more of a parody than anything else. I hope that answers your question. What do you think about the reboot? Um, I'll shoot back right away. It's, it's great entertainment, <laughs> but that's what it is. Thank you. Yeah, 
I would agree with that, and that's why I also approach it as a sort of a parody. But uh, to respond to that uh, a, little, uh, a little bit more, perhaps, is I think uh, Star Trek as a format definitely works better on television than on the big movie screen. So one thing that I personally would like to see is a return of Star Trek to the television screen or some other uh, uh, media format, particularly now with on-demand uh, on streaming, Netflix, whatever, that might be a potent, more potent platform. Wow, I'm working in science fiction studies, and I told you science fiction is not about predicting the future, so I'll hold back on that. I'd like to see it, I'd hold back on that. I'm sorry. Okay, any other questions? Good question, though. The toughest one at the, right at the beginning. Here's your chance. Yes, Johannes. Science fiction is not so much about um, utopia in, in the way how a, diff how a society would look in, in the future, but they just use things that look like the future, mm -hmm. because it's like technology that we still don't mm -hmm. have. And all the rest is actually not really utopian. It's more, I'm, I'm more like, I don't know, a novel or whatever. Right. some remarks about mm -hmm. uh, utopia and the utopian elements and I'm wondering whether you just use that because you said Star Trek is one of the science fiction uh, science fictions that have a, like a positive or a hopeful mm -hmm. outlook on the future or whether you think it really presents something like a closed um, picture of, of a better and mm -hmm. a future in general. Mm -hmm. I think, no, thanks, uh, thanks for the question. I think you already gave uh, yourself the best answer. I think the elements of utopia is the way to go. It's definitely not as self-enclosed or completely like a complete thought experiment that envisions something completely different. Uh, something uh, because there is too, way, uh, too much um, a Star Trek's world that is actually uh, modeled on, a, on the 18th and 19th century past. And then we have this, these allegorical intentions commenting on contemporary issues, uh, but it still has or at least that's the label that is often uh, used to describe Star Trek as utopian because it's generally equated with a more positive, hopeful outlook. Also a bit of an, a humanistic experiment, perhaps. But I think the way to go is to uh, see utopian elements at work rather than uh, full hardcore utopia. I mean, I, 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 would, I, would, uh, I would think you're uh, thinking of Thomas More by any chance, as all, going all the way back to utopia. I, I don't know whether that answered your question, but you'd have to give us your definition for utopia first in order to yeah, have more of a... That, that's a different point to ask the question, because I could not really define mm -hmm. it now, but uh, I was wondering... Uh, I mean, these are two genres, right? Right. Say right. science fiction, and I'm wondering how they are connected. I mean, that also points to the, the very the tricky, part, uh, the tricky question of how we define utopia. There's usually two approaches. It's in the word. It's either a good place or the other place, right? Uh, so that's 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 a that's sort of a it's two schools of thought even. And I once attended a conference where two people got into a very heated debate about that, which of the either one, uh, which of uh, these two it is, um, and what it means. So I think it's utopian elements. That's how I would uh, see it work. And but those are essential still to the Star Trek vision. I hope that answers the question, or at least the thought experiment. <laughs> More food for thought. Okay, well, still good for time. Two questions, easily, if you'd like. Now's your chance. <coughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Just uh, just a quick, uh, thing. did you say that I said that Star Trek was transmedia? No, I, I'm pretty sure I didn't. Well, that's okay. Uh, I mean, Star Trek would perhaps um, have the potential 
to spread across more media. Um, this is a very notorious record of uh, producing very poor video game material, unfortunately, um, uh, because it was really tailor-made to television format. Um, I don't know. We'd have to we'd have to engage in a thought experiment there, quite frankly. I think we see more and more of a, of a back and forth and blending. I mean, that's, uh, that, that goes back all the way to 70s and 80s even, uh, particularly in the 80s with televisuality, where we see uh, many of the great effects that we uh, usually just got or associated with the cinema actually uh, making it to the television screen now. Now what we got at home, huge television screens, fantastic graphics. Yeah, and HBO and Netflix and that sort of stuff, right? Um, I see there a uh, potential. Uh, but probably by way of television. But again, it's just me guessing. I'd like to see it return in a, in a, for, a format that provokes uh, critical thinking, uh, includes contemporary issues. We've got plenty to deal with. Um, and that's, that's the best response I can think of. Um, I don't know whether the current entertainment industry structures and strictures would allow for that. I do not know. Perhaps our uh, uh, visiting Fulbright specialist might also pick up on that during his talk. All right, he gives me a nod. We got you covered. So, 28th of October. <laughs> okay, one final question, perhaps. Something to round things off. I need to turn it into a fan talk, but since we're at it, um, what's your favorite? Uh, <laughs> All right, good. Well, it's, I, I'm glad that you're not the first to ask me the, uh, today because I was already, uh, Martin and I already gave an interview today and we were asked the, exactly the same question. So while I grew up with, uh, on uh, the original series, believe it or not, uh, my being a fan goes all the way back to me being this tall. Uh, it's the age of four, basically, uh, having reached the academic stage now. Um, <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm forced to name a favorite, I'd always go for Deep Space Nine. Oh, I, I can see nods here. It would always be Deep Space Nine. And it would, for me also personally, it would always be uh, Captain Benjamin Sisko also. Why? Why? Oh, wow, wow. I don't know whether we have time for that. Uh, see, that's, that's the problem once you name a favorite, right? I guess you're Picard Man back up there. Yeah, you're Picard Man back up there. I got that. Um, uh, quite frankly, I don't have a short answer to that. It's just it's pr also a personal thing. But quite frankly, uh, I like the entire continuum. I work with the entire continuum. I use the entire continuum also in my classes whenever possible. So whether it's the original show all the way to Enterprise also, except the reboot. So, but we can continue this conversation if you'd like afterwards or after another uh, session. Unless there is a follow-up question. Who's your favorite? Was I right with yeah, Picard? Yeah, OK. OK. Fair enough. OK. Well, thanks again. Uh, thanks for a great opening. And we'll be back next week with Joachim Alga, who sits in the second row, uh, giving a little bit of uh, a talk about popular culture, uh, Star Trek interfacing with uh, real science, and a bit more of that reciprocal relationship that I talked about in the beginning. Thanks again.